Good evening. Today I'm talking to Graham Smith. Uh, hello. Would you like to introduce yourself and tell us a bit more about yourself? Yeah. I'm <clears throat> uh, Graham Smith. I'm a, currently a hotelier. I run a hotel and wedding venue near Gretna Green. I am a former farmer, a former joiner, and I seem I got stuck in this hotelier lark because I've been doing it for 20 years now. Uh, I've always been a fan of crime fiction, and I have three series under my own name. They are D.I. Harry Evans series and the D.C. Beth Young series, both set in Cumbria and the Lake District. I have the Jake Boulder series set in the United States and under the pseudonym of John Ryder, I have the Grant Fletcher series, which is also set in America. And he's the character I've been writing about most recently. Uh, the first two books in the series, first shot and final second, uh, are now available on Kindle, as are all my other titles. And the third in the series, Third Kill, is due out on the 28th of April. Um, I love writing police procedurals, crime action thrillers, love reading right across the crime genre, although I dare say that cosy is where I'm least often found. I like a bit of blood and guts and a, a decent murder or two, possibly even not car chase in what I like to read. Uh, delighted to be here talking to you tonight. Big thanks to Donna for hosting this and being the wonderful questionnaire that she is. <laughs> so, did you always want to be a writer? I guess a small part of me did, although I didn't know it until I was pretty much in my late 30s when I started writing. That's about 10 years ago now, but I had a horrifically bad attempt at writing in a jotter that I'd liberated from the school cupboard. And I'd be about 14, 15 at the time. And thank God that jotter has been lost <laughs> to the sands of time because it would be terrible. My first attempt at grown up writing was terrible. So I'm sure that. Um, the world of literature is a better place because that the first attempt at writing never got finished, never got aired, and most probably got burned. <laughs> so what made you finally take the plunge and go for it? Well, I was reviewing uh, for the website crimesquad.com, doing a lot of author interviews, um, and more and more people were asking, are you not going to write something then, Graham? So when for the umpteenth time I tossed a book across the room muttering, I could write better than that, it finally became time for me to put my mouth, my money where my mouth was. And I had the first attempt and I found out I couldn't write better than that. But I kept at it, I kept learning, I've learned my trade craft. And now I'd like to think at least one of my books is better than one of the ones I tossed aside. <laughs> uh, why did you write, decide to write so many different series and how do you keep up with them all? Um, it's very much to do with um, the storylines and demand from publishers. I also like to keep things interesting for myself. Uh, the original series, D.I. Harry Evans, I was two books into that. And then uh, I knew that the third book wouldn't be published for quite a while. And that gave me a time, time to write something else. And because I'd been very close to a deal with an American publisher uh, from a debut novel, Snatch from Home, before I got a deal with Caffeine Nights, who eventually published it, I let my cussed nature kick in. And Snatch for Home with the American publisher, it got past the editor, they loved it. The support editors all loved it. It was read by the proprietors who loved it. The marketing team turned around and said, we can't sell a British set book by a British author to an American market. 
but that was it. I got the thumbs down. So that rankled for a while, but I got the deal for Snatched and the, the next book in the series, I Know Your Secret. But when I got time to write, I thought, I'm going to show these American publishers. So I wrote a book set in America. That was the first Jake Bonder novel. Uh, that became a Kindle bestseller in the UK and Canada. At one point, when it was on a special promo, it was the number one downloaded book in the English language. Sadly, it was free at the time, and I wasn't making any money off it. But that is quite a distinction. UK, the US, Canada, Australia, all four of those territories, it was number one in the free chart. So. <clears throat> yeah, it certainly appealed to quite a lot of people, I would say. <laughs> so how do you keep up with all your different characters, the character names, the settings? I take notes, as well as the main document that I'm working on, I have a separate document whereby I keep details of characters. And if I describe someone as, I don't know, having glasses and red hair, then I'll um, make a note of that. And I keep a note that, you know, Donna's father is Jim. If I mention it in the book, I make a note of that because I learned when writing Snatch that when you go back to check these details, you can scroll through 50 pages trying to find it. Whereas if you've got a document with all the details about Donna on it, then it's 10 seconds to check a fact instead of 20 minutes plus, you know. And again, if Jim becomes more of a character, I'll start doing personal relationships and details and everything. I, I keep their physical appearance, their importance in the story, their family connections, their nature. At times, you know, if it, quite often I'll give someone a, a speech tick or something like that. So I keep a note of that to just keep myself refreshed and so on. Especially if you're writing books in one series and then another interlocking, kind of like that. You need a far better memory than mine. So that's where my Word documents come in. Would you ever cross over characters from your series? I've thought about it, but I've got two series with one publisher, another series with a second, and a third series, about fourth series, I suppose, with the third publisher. So you have to be very careful about copyright and all that kind of thing. It would be nice to put all of the lead characters in a room together, you know, maybe just sit them around the table in a bar or whatever. But one of them's a grumpy old sod. The other two are most likely to throw a punch than a smile. And then you've got DC Beth Young trying to make sense of it or stop the Neanderthal men fighting. So. <laughs> and if, yeah. I, if I did have them raise their fists at each other, I couldn't let any one of them win because it, it, it would weaken them in my eyes, let alone any reader's eyes. So. <laughs> Yeah, you'd have to stop them before they started, wouldn't you? I'd have to get a woman to come in and tell them to behave, wouldn't you? Uh, well, exactly. I mean, otherwise it'd end up like the 80s arms race where it only mutually assured destruction would stop them fighting. <laughs> uh, do you have any series that you'd... Which or which of your series would you most like to be a character in? That's a really good question. You've caught me off guard with that. It's not one I've ever been asked before. If I was going to be a minor character, just imparting a little bit of information and could stay safe, I'd be quite happy in all of them. I wouldn't want to be anywhere near victimhood or anything like that in any of the series because I'd die screaming. That's such a given. <laughs> um, yeah, they'd all be fun. I mean, Harry Evans is probably the character that's got the most of me in him. He's cussed, he, you know, he drinks too much, swears at people, does his own thing. Um, whereas Jake Boulder and 
Grant Fletcher are very much more um, characters that I would like to be. And well, certainly Beth Young, no, I'm not ready for um, that kind of integration into a new society <laughs> yet. Perhaps new way of life would be a better way of putting it. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, and if you were a character in a book, how would you like to die? Quickly and painlessly. <laughs> in the sleep would do. <laughs> I don't think that's an option in crime fiction, is it? <laughs> no. No, I don't, I don't think it is, unless, unless you're 120, 12 or something. <laughs> Um, what's the most interesting thing you found out when researching your books? Oh, there's a lot of fascinating things. Um, I lost the most time to research when writing Kindred Killers, which is Jake Boulder 2. Um, basically, the, the book is about race hate crimes, and the bad guys were enacting their kills in ways that were culturally, culturally representative of their victim's ethnicity. So I went onto the internet and I looked up, you know, such things and oh my God, for a ghoul, a crime writer, crime reader, fan, it was fascinating some of the stuff that they used to do. Um, I mean, there was the things like the Brahma Bull, um, I, I learned a lot about um, Harry Carey and Seppuku um, for those novels. Um, and, that, and that was actually used in Watching the Bodies. But I, I, I did put in what I'd learned. But I think the one of the most horrific ideas that I found was a Chinese one where they would strap somebody over a freshly planted um, bamboo field. A bamboo can grow up to three feet a day and it was growing right through the victims. So that was a horrible, horrible agonizing uh, deaths and so on. And that was all fascinating. I'm a crime writer, <laughs> and I'm laughing it up. <laughs> yeah, this is why I do yeah. forensics, it's fascinating. <laughs> yeah, I mean, when you get into this kind of thing and you learn what can and has been done by one human to another. It, it's ghoulish and it's macabre and it's all the rest of it, but it's fascinating. It's really interesting. <laughs> it, yeah, this right, is why I like talking to crime writers because they don't think I'm weird or disgusting. They're like, oh, tell me more. <laughs> yeah, I, absolutely. And as a crime writer, you can explore a lot of these things without showing too much on the page because you've got to think of, about your reader's sensibilities as well. Not every reader who picks up the book is going to be as fascinated by the macabre as myself. You know, there's usually clues on the, in, in the cover and on the back uh, description. But yeah, I can have some pretty heavy deaths, but I tend to do them off the page and investigate them through the investigator's eyes or even if it's done in the path lab, I tend to do it there. And that's a more surgical, clinical um, <clears throat> way of approaching the subject rather than having the gratuitous murder scene. Yeah. Um, I totally forgot what I was going to ask you. Do you hide any secret jokes or messages in your books? Oh, there's, there's quite a lot of duck eggs in there. Um, M.W. Craven, Mike Craven and I, we have a little kick at each other from time to time <laughs> in the books. Awesome. You know. <laughs> it, it, it's not unknown for one of us to use the other's name in vain. <laughs> so, you know, but there's, there's, <clears throat> there's so many little things. I mean, some of the stuff that I put in is very, very deeply personal. Um, like the night 
my son was born, got a puncture on the way to the hospital and had to change it up a country lane in the dark, working by touch, all of that. Great material, it, that went in, that went in our book. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, one, oh, what else have I put in? Uh, Grant Fletcher's got a dog who happens to have the same name as my dog, or rather my son's dog. So there's, there's a lot of little bits and pieces in there. There's a few family names crept in and so on as well. So. And do you have any um, anything you absolutely will never write about? Um, there's certain subjects I would steer clear of. I mean, a lot of them are entire genres. I wouldn't write horror or romance or sci-fi or fantasy because I don't read them. I don't know them. Don't get me wrong, I love Game of Thrones and Lord of the Rings, but that's just hitting the headlines of the fantasy world. It's not delving deep. So I wouldn't know about them. When it comes to crime topics, I wouldn't go near. I have steered away from paedophilia and general outright harm to kids. I don't find it interesting as a father myself I don't really want to read about it. I sure as hell don't want to research it because the minute you, you go on the internet to try and search that thing, you get a knock on the door. <laughs> That's a good point, you actually. Know, <laughs> you know, you, know you, you can research guns and medieval torture all day long, but the minute you... No, not going no. near that. It doesn't <laughs> interest me. It disgusts me, you know, and I would probably end up writing a novel with just filled with hate for paedophiles, which is how the world should be, but it wouldn't be very entertaining. It would be one long rat. So I keep away for that. I also have a fantastic idea for a terrorist plot where the death toll would be in the tens of thousands. I will never write that book. Never write that book because I couldn't live with the fact that if it ever happened, I would always wonder if they'd got that idea from me. Yeah. So, I think most authors have some idea of a terrorist plot. Yeah, that's quite sad, really, I suppose. But I can see your point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, how do you come up with character names? I... <clears throat> I'll take a scroll through Facebook. I'll watch the credits on a film or TV show. So I often have the TV on in the background when I'm writing. I consider the character. You know, if I'm writing about a 95-year-old spinster who lives in a quaint village, I'm not going to call her Kelly with an I. I'm perhaps going to give her a Mabel or a Mavis or a Una or Persephone or something like that. Again, you know, names count for social status. They count for ethnic background. They count for a lot of things. So I do tend to choose names quite carefully if I want to convey a specific message, you know, um, to that. And interestingly, the idea that I've had for the next book, then my editor wanted me to change the surnames uh, of one of the lead couples because they were a little bit too unusual and she wanted something more common. So, you know, it's not just me that gets to say it. I've had other character names changed um upon me which is really hard when you've written a book because you spend ninety thousand words thinking about a character with one name then you have to realize she's not called that anymore <laughs> um if you ever had dreams or nightmares about your characters not dreams or nightmares as such but the weird thing is when i've been chewing over a problem I can find myself daydreaming and listening to my characters having an argument or whatever, you know, just, uh, 
you know, just when you let your thoughts wander a wee bit, you know, maybe in the adverts or something when you're watching the telly, although we all tape it now on Sky Plus and swizzle through the adverts. <laughs> You yeah. know, we do. We do. It's a waste of money spending money on advertising on TV because everybody yeah. needs it. <laughs> do right, yeah. But, you know, moments like that, I find myself at times listening to my characters talking and interacting with each other. It's weird because they can do the voices and everything. <laughs> I can't. <laughs> Um, uh, what's your biggest fear and would you ever write about it? I don't know. It'd be hard to um, pinpoint my biggest fear, you know. Is it I'm not afraid of heights or drowning or flying or, you know, I've none of the recognised phobias or anything like that, you know. Would it be something more self-aware, like fear of failure, you know, fear of letting down my family or anything like that? I don't know. I mean, again, a lot of these kind of topics, they creep in to character assessments. Character, character, if you will. You know, it's it, it's inbuilt into the characters and it, it can be shown through their emotions and interactions with other characters you know, their actions and how they go about things and internal monologues if uh, we go down that kind of route. So I don't know. I've maybe already written about it. <laughs> you know? Yeah, mine's a dentist, so I'm not really sure that works in a crime fiction book, because I'm sure there's a way. <laughs> I'm not afraid of the dentist. It's that woman in reception with a handout. I don't like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, that's quite scary as well. Very expensive yeah. hobby <laughs> or not. Um, are you a plotter or a pantser? I have been both. I, I started out as a pantser and wrote my first 10 or 12 novels that way. And in a conversation with um, Al Guthrie, who's now my agent, we were discussing the merits of plotting versus pantsing, and he advised me to have a go. And after years of just totally making it up and then making it up, but keeping detailed notes on what I put in each chapter for memory references later, I found that I was plotting two or three chapters ahead and two or three became four and five. So my process was always evolving from plotter from Panzer to Plotter before that conversation. But Al's a very clever guy, someone I respect hugely. Um, and I thought, I'll give it a go. And then I, I pitched an idea to him. He said, yeah, I like the sound of that. Send me an outline, will you? So then I had to go and create a proper outline for the first time. But, but now I mean, my outlines run anywhere between eight and 10,000 words. Um, and what do you enjoy most about writing and what do you dislike most? I love getting that first draft down, seeing where the story's going, because even though I do work to an outline, I work to, shall we say, a fluid outline. If I get to chapter 65 and I've still got more to say before I start chapter 66, I'll put in a 65A or another 66 and renumber everything after that. <laughs> Likewise, I'll cut a chapter out for think, oh, shoot, I've already said that. <laughs> I've covered that. That's, that's been done elsewhere. I'm not going to repeat myself. So I'll, I'll chop a chapter out. Um, <clears throat> so I love that. I love the brainstorming. Uh, a few good mates brainstorm with Al, brainstorm with my editor at Bukature, Isabel Aikenhead, from time to time. You know, they'll suggest an idea. Well, how about a standalone? Or could you do something like this? Or try that? And, yeah, OK. Give us a... You know, and I'll go and lock up some rough ideas, you know, give them a selection, and they'll come back and, you know, poke holes in them or quiz and test, press me on it. And a lot of the time, they're 
raising points that I've already considered or already should have considered. And from there, we get to that of a couple of good mates that I do the same thing with, you know, just break testing ideas, you know, what's the motivation? Why is he killing that way? You know, so on and so forth. And it does me good to be challenged that way, to have someone really push at my ideas, really test them and make me think deeper and harder about them. I absolutely love when I meet readers who've enjoyed my book. Um, that's a wonderful feeling. That will never get old. I've sold 10, 10 million books a day for the rest of my life. Having readers come up and tell me they love my book would never get old. I hate editing. Yes, Isabel, if you're watching, I know it makes my books better. And I know it's a vital part of the process, but I hate it. There's lots of unmuttered swearing when it happens. <laughs> yeah, I don't think you're alone. <laughs> no. But it, again, it brings the book alive. There's a lot of them kind of challenges from the editor here. This doesn't make sense. You know, he, he can't be there. He, he was at the other side of town three seconds ago. <laughs> you know, maybe it's maybe a wild example, but you know. Me up and why is he doing this? Can we have a bit more of this and a bit more of the other? Really pinpoints things just to make it better. And although I grumble about it, the edits do certainly improve the novel. But by the time the edits come in, I'm off with I've got a shiny new idea. I want to be either plotting or um, brainstorming or getting that first draft down to see what the story shape is going to be. Do you have lots of author friends? Um, too many to count. Too many to count. Um, I've been very lucky. I've made some friendships that I'm sure will be for life. Um, Matt Hilton, Colbury, Craig Russell's a good friend. Michael Malone, Mike Craven, MW Craven. The list is endless. Amit Dan, Zoe Sharp. And block switch, Lucy Cameron. I could throw names at you for an hour. I really could. Just other people I know and I've met going to events like the Harrogate Book Festival, or Bloody Scotland up in Stirling, uh, Newcastle Noir when it's on. Just hanging out with writer friends. You sit, good few beers, a chat, a laugh, catch up with everyone. Yeah. I've ever made so many writer friends and reader friends and blogger friends and all the rest of it. You know, it, it's my book tribe. You know, it, I've got friends who are agents that don't represent me. I've got, I know publicists, I know editors at other publishing houses. You know, it, it's all just the book tribe. It's the only way to describe it. <laughs> yeah, it is. It's a nice place to be as well. It really is. Yeah, hopefully I can go to Harrogate this year. Hi, with luck. Well, I'll see you in the bar. <laughs> yeah, a couple of authors I speak to apparently barely leave the bar, so or the beer tent. I was told. So, yeah, that's where I'm going to have to go to meet some of them. I think <laughs> otherwise I'll never see them. <laughs> that's where all the best fun is. Yeah, uh, Rob Ashman being one. Apparently, he's one of the most guilty of drinking. Lots. <laughs> yeah, I've had a drink with Robert Harrogate before. <laughs> He's promised me a drink. Apparently, uh, it's going to be like getting blood out of the stone to get it out of him. So, <laughs> <Yeah. Bless him. laughs> um, what's your most embarrassing story? Most embarrassing story. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, it's so. Uh, I've got a scar on my hand. You probably can't see it, but it, it used to. It, it goes across there, but it used to go right the way round to there. I picked that up at eight year old on a motorcycle. Um, it was at like a gala carnival day at Gretna, and it was called the Highland Gathering. There was all kinds of events on, and there was these little motorbikes for kids. 
So a few of us got on, and of course, we're told not to race, and then we raced. And I actually scratched that my hand on the someone else's brake lever as I was overtaking, going round the corner. <laughs> You boys, honestly, it's you're so funny. <laughs> I'm not at all competitive. No, no, I, I totally got that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm sure the other person wasn't either that clearly wasn't going to let you pass. I got past. I even had to go around the outside, but I got past. <laughs> I thought you like. <laughs> um, if you were to spend a day with an author dead or alive, who would you choose? <clears throat> oh, I'm lucky in that I've spent time with so many author friends. Um, so I'm going to go for someone who I couldn't possibly meet because he's passed away many years ago. I'm going to say Alistair MacLean, the 50s, 60s, 70s uh, thriller writer. Um, he wrote some fantastic books, HMS Ulysses, Fear is the Key, Ice Station Zebra, Guns of Navarone, Where Eagles Dare, so many of these are big names, Sunday matinee films, um, and so on. Absolutely fantastic author. And what's your biggest dream as an author? to <clears throat> entertain readers, to hopefully get to a position in life where I can write full time, you know, um, because I run a busy hotel and wedding venue, I don't get a lot of time for writing. I don't get as much time as I would like. Quite often I feel pressured and oh, I've got to write tonight because I've got a deadline to hit and everything. I would like to still have the deadlines and everything, but I would like a little bit less pressure on my time. But I would probably procrastinate, leave it all at the last minute and then still feel pressure. <laughs> uh, what would those closest to you say your worst habits are? Uh, depends who you ask. <laughs> um, take a pick from drinking, swearing, Smoking, <laughs> smoking and drinking while swearing. <laughs> yeah, I can sense the theme. <laughs> uh, what three words would your friends use to describe you? Are we talking complimentary friends or people like Mike Craven? <laughs> One of each. <laughs> would Mike Cravens um, be broadcastable? <laughs> <clears throat> well, he'd say stupid. <laughs> um, I suppose quite a few would say I'm hard working um, because I am, because I've got such a busy life, I have to put the hours in, I have to work hard. Um, and third thing, yeah. Dedicated, perhaps. And what would Mike Craven say apart from stupid? <laughs> He'd probably go with the others. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm not used to insults to him. I can't think what he would say that would be nice. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, he's a funny guy, isn't he? I'm speaking to him in uh, just before his new book comes out, actually. So I'll ask yeah. him. Yeah. yeah, well, if he sees if he sees this, he'll probably use that opportunity to get some kicks of me. <laughs> I'll have to tag him in it when I post it. <laughs> Bless him. Um, if you were to invite four famous people to a dinner party, who would you invite? Um. Groucho Marx for his wit, Gordon Ramsay to do the cooking, um, oh, 
Al Murray, just to see him bounce off Groucho Marx and Slash. Sounds interesting. Oh. <laughs> Sounds yeah, lively. No, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, have you had famous people stay at your hotel? <laughs> I've had one or two over the years. Um, Kerry Katona had one of her, her weddings here. Oh, nice. <laughs> Can't stop that woman. <laughs> we also had John Walk. Uh, he married here. Uh, former Liverpool uh, Ipswich and Scotland footballer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but back in the 80s, so possibly before you were born. I was born in 83, so yeah. yeah. Are you a football fan? Huge, huge. Um, I love um, watching Carlisle United. Whenever possible, I'll go to the games with my son, been watching them on the laptop through the club's iFollow system uh, of late. They were doing brilliantly. Um, around the turn of the year, they were top of the league with games in hand. They've still got the games in hand, but now they're about 10th after losing six games. So. Yeah, for my sins, I'm a Luton Town fan, so we beat you quite a few times on our way back up to the Championship. <laughs> I, yes, you would. You yeah. would, but it's it's all part and parcel of things, you know. It's football. You you take the good with the you take the rough with the smooth. Sorry. Yeah, well, Luton have had quite a lot of rough, so we we don't mind our position now. We're mid table. We're absolutely fine with that. <laughs> we're, we're happy to stay there for now. Aye. If you if you get up to the Premiership or anything like that, then you need bags and bags of money to survive. A lot of the smaller town clubs just can't compete anymore because they don't have the fan base. So. Yeah, I mean, we've got the fan base. I think we're one of the best supported teams, but we just don't have the money. We're getting a new uh, stadium as well. So obviously, yeah, it's going to cost. Well, probably. Um, I totally forgot what I was going to ask you again now. Getting all distracted. Oh, what do you like to do when you're not working and writing? Um, read box sets on the telly, spend time with my son, uh, socialise with friends and family. Go, you know, hang out. Typical guy stuff. <laughs> well, um, and what's some of the best books you read last year? Some of the best books I read last year, um, I was very lucky to read Craig Russell's um, Hide, which is out, I think it's out this month. Um, it's about, it's set in Victorian Edinburgh, and the lead detective is a man known as Hyde, H-Y-D-E, and it's influenced by the curious case of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Uh -huh. You know, uh, Robert Louis Stevenson's book, but in the same way that the Da Vinci Code was perhaps a reworking of what we knew about the Bible, this is a similar kind of thing. So, oh, wow. Yeah, utterly, utterly brilliant. Um, Mike Craven's The Curator was excellent. Yeah. Uh, have I redeemed myself, Mike? <laughs> <laughs> he knows. Uh, <laughs> he knows how good that is. He gets told all the time. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, <laughs> no, I, I read a lot of great books. I went back and I read, uh, I think it was Riot Act or Hat No, Till Light was Hard Knocks by Zoe Sharp. That was fantastic. Um, that was Charlie Fox infiltrating a training camp for bodyguards. And that kind of set her on the, the road to becoming a close contact uh, bodyguard or close personal escort. So that was uh, very interesting as well. So, yeah, I mean, there's, there's thousands of great books out there. There's hundreds published every week, if not every day. Yeah, I know. That's why TBR polls are insane, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, um, what's coming next for you? 
what's coming next? Well, I'm working on the next um, novel written as John Ryder. I've got um, two books with my agent. One's out on submission. The other's waiting his feedback and edits. whoop de doop de doo um, <laughs> Third Kill comes out the 28th of April. So I'm looking forward to that. That sees Grant Fletcher um, hunting a deadly assassin in Las Vegas. So that's something that, uh, yeah, it, it's, it's a wee bit different. It explores quite a few moral conundrums as well as having gunfights and so on. And it was great fun to write. Um, in as much as every other book I, I'd written to that point featuring Grant Fletcher had him in a rural setting. So it was good to put him in a city and have city problems for him to deal with. Um, yeah, well, um, you've got lots coming up then, that's good. <laughs> It'd be a nice busy yeah. year for you. <laughs> uh, yeah, oh, definitely. Well, I've got this book to finish and hand in by the 1st of April. And then the next one to be in by the 1st of June. So I have a lot to do. I have a lot yeah. to do. <laughs> yeah, you do. <laughs> wow. <laughs> well, I don't think I have any more questions for you, unless you think there's anything I haven't asked you that you want to tell us. Um, no, you, you've kind of covered all, all the um, interesting bits. Uh, just want to finish off. Big thank you to you, Donna, and to anyone who tunes in and listens to me rambling on for an hour. <laughs> uh, before we go, do you just want to tell everyone where they can find out more about you and where they can find your books? Yeah. Um, you can find out more about me at grahamsmithauthor.com or johnryder.com, depending on which version of me you like the best. Um, <laughs> all my books can be found on Amazon. Um, most are in Kindle and paperback uh, can be got through Amazon. And a few of them, uh, certainly the Beth Young series, the Grant Fletcher series, and the first two Jake Boulders can also be bought as audiobooks. So whatever flavour your poison, there's a version out there for you. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you very much. Yeah. No problem. Thank you very much, Donna, and thanks to all those who've tuned in. Thank you now. <laughs>